and I decided to make my base there in Mayapur. So that's when I was staying in the same temple, I guess you could say, the Jaipataka Swami. We got to know each other quite well. However, I was always on tra traveling Sankirtan, so I was never really there much. And then from that traveling Sankirtan, we joined the BBT Library Party. We were distributing full sets of Prabhupada's books. All the Bhagavatams, Chaitanya Bhagavad Gita, Krishna books, every book Prabhupada ever, ever put out. We called it the Encyclopedia of Vedic Knowledge. And so after we did all of India, we did Southeast Asia. And we, we, you know, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines and Bangladesh. So when I came back, I had remarked to one of my god brothers, who was Swami also, how I really liked Bangladesh. And I guess it got back to Jaipataka Swami. So one day, I would request that Jaipataka Swami wants to see you. Okay. So we went up there. He said, how is it going? I said, everything's going great. You're really fired up, yes. I said, yeah, you're doing great service. But you know, Prabhupada really wanted to establish a center in Bangladesh. I said, oh, that's wonderful. I really liked it there. He said, we want you to go there and start it. I said, oh, I can't do that. No way. Because I'm traveling all over the world distributing full sets of Prabhupada's books. That's the most important service. So, you know, I'm sure you'll find somebody else. I sent Prabhupada Vishnu or somebody else. And he said, I said, that, you know, I'm doing the most important service. He said, no, this is the most important service. I'm giving you a whole country. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he preached to me, he preached to me, and convinced me that I should go to Bangladesh and give up distributing Prabhupada's book. <laughs> Uh, you can listen to me because first it was very powerful in his presentation. Also, I really loved Bangladesh. I was there. I saw a lot of people and the culture and everything. So, finally I said, okay, <laughs> you talked me into it. And uh, then when I went and told the other devotees in the library party I was leaving, they couldn't believe it. <laughs> but this is the topmost service. There's no higher service. Well, you know, Chaitanya is giving me a whole country. <laughs> so I went there. And so when we went there, there was nothing, not zero. We stayed in a hotel for the first two months. Then we finally got a house, finally began to preach. And although it's a Muslim country today in Bangladesh, we have over 20 centers. Oh, wow. So, because Jai Pataka Maharaj sent me there, that changed the whole course of my life. If I wouldn't have gone there, I don't know what would have happened to me. But that's when I really got into Kirtan. I was already studying Bengali in Mayapur, but then I really got much more into Bengali. So he was speaking Bengali, I was speaking Bengali, so we had that in common. He was the GBC, I was the temple president there. And, uh, you know, he was giving me encouragement, and then I founded the first Hindu society in Bangladesh. And uh, so, he was very affectionate to me. Afterwards, I left Bangladesh, and then he made me temple president in Jagannath Puri. And uh, he was always very affectionate. Every time we would meet, you go, Evo! You give me a big bear hug and lift me up. <laughs> you know, so my feet weren't touching the ground. <laughs> so, 
So I, I was thinking, well, that's very affectionate, you know, it's nice. Then in, in 1979, I came back from Bangladesh uh, to Mayapur. We used to come to Mayapur to get all the Bengali books, and we would smuggle them back into Bangladesh, Muslim country. We had a van with false bottoms, and we would smuggle all those books in. But that time in 79, when I came back, it was a flood. It was a huge flood, crane plowing. So Jai Pataka had organized food distribution, huge pots of prashadam, which went out in motor boats and to, to people who were stranded. On, you know, they, they were in some high ground, but all around them was, was flood, so that they were like in an island. <coughs> some of them were you know, on top of their homes, on the roof. Living. So he said, come with me. So we went on this boat, and we went to some place where these people were, you know, didn't have any food. We had a big pot of kitchu. And these people were so hungry, they had plates, and they were just practically jumping on the boat. You know, we were trying to serve them. Uh, you know, so he organized that. He, he organized so many things. And uh, then that was, I was, finally I came back to the West. And uh, I was just going to India and coming back, so I left living in India for some time. Then I came back to India, and that was when he had had his stroke. And so I was in Mayapur, he was there in a wheelchair. So he saw me, he called me over, and he spoke to me, he said, can you understand me? I said, yes, I can, are you sure? He wanted to make sure that when he spoke, he could be understood. I said, well, I can understand you. And then I spoke to him heart to heart. I said, you know, Maharaj, you spent your whole life going to practically every town and village, to every country of the world, and you made devotees everywhere. And I think that now you should just stay in my report. It's your Prabhupada, Prabhupada, and let all those people that you preach to all over the world reciprocate and come to you. That was my advice. I thought it was good advice. <laughs> but he didn't pay any attention. He just kept on traveling. And one thing I noticed year after year after year, he had the most unbelievable energy. He could just keep going and going and going. I thought I had energy. He was way beyond me. And uh, I would meet him from place, you know, while I was traveling around and he was traveling. The last time I met him was in Dubai. I was flying in for a program in Bahrain, and so was he. We met in Dubai, and then we caught the same plane. He was still in his wheelchair. He needed so many helpers to put him on the plane and everything. You could see it was really a struggle for him, but he couldn't be stopped. Nothing was going to stop. This is what I, this is what I got out of it. That nothing can stop Jack Rataka from preaching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's his glory. That he's nothing can stop him. You go on to his last dying breath. And uh, I'm amazed. That he's what he's doing now. Most people in his situation, they would have taken my advice, stayed in one place. But he carries on as if nothing had happened. And it's much more difficult for him now, much more difficult than it ever was before, but he still does it. And that's why he's so glorious. We should learn from that. From his example, he's giving the personal example that with firm determination, we overcome all obstacles. We meet every challenge and, and overcome, and nothing can stop us. Nothing can stop our devotional service, nothing can slow it down. He's the embodiment of that determination, Dhrida Vrata. He's taken a firm vow that he's determined to go out and preach. 
So, all the rest of the time, it's like, all right. 